So where we are is, uh, I gave you the uh, rundown of the case studies, for example, of how the CES grant, I start with the problem and uh, work your translations and then the design requirements and then from that you saw that you can uh, break it down into what are the key factors that you can look up through the chart and from that you can narrow down your material choices, you do your screening, ranking, apply your material indices and then uh, come up with a final recommendation more or less. And then we kind of um, saw that that all belonged to the materials universe and last week we started um, talking about the process universe, right? And how these all, uh, all these techniques come together in terms of manufacturing. So today, uh, last time I kind of uh, just summarized about the metals and again what did we say? We talked about bulk metals, sheet metals and cast metals. In bulk you saw that there was forging, rolling, drawing and extrusion. In sheet was sheet and then in uh, cast you had sand casting and die casting and investment casting, right? And all hips and so on. So those are all the uh, just, we haven't gotten into many others in that family, but remember we are just talking about how to approach these things, not get into each manufacturing method per se. Then when you went to additive and subtractive, you saw that in subtractive you had machining, you had all the uh, things tied to uh, all the way precision electrochemical machining, then we talked about standard uh, lathe work, CNC, planing, milling, boring, and all the various uh, standard uh, drilling and so on. And then we saw that uh, when it came to additive, you have this whole range of new methods like uh, for metals even, metal wire feed additive or metal powder additive, right? laser sintering, uh, powder bed, all these approaches to uh, producing complex metal parts. And the reality is somewhere always in between that you have to take metals here, you have to take uh, polymers here, composites there and work with hybrid. So later, not today, but I will spend the class specifically on hybrid. Uh, today what I thought is I will uh, similarly just uh, walk you through some of the key pl plastics uh, processes, polymers, which you already know, but I just want to recap that. And then we'll get into some actual products and then kind of walk our way through critical analysis of those products. That, that's kind of how I'm uh, thinking to structure today's thing. So where we were, like, you know, I'll redraw this thing. If you look at the process universe, we saw that uh, uh, when you're doing grant art particularly, they would divide it up into metals, uh, ceramics, uh, polymers and uh, uh, foams and then composites, right? So they would uh, um, break off the various families in that order. Um, then in that they would uh, spend some time into the classifications of those. Uh, today we'll just spend more time on this aspect of it. So when you say polymers, again, in a five-minute nutshell, uh, polymers, uh, uh, the generic name for that is, uh, common man considers that as <coughs> plastic. So when you say plastics, uh, that is understood to be polymers. And everybody uh, knows that uh, it's interchangeably used. So some of the key uh, uh, differentiators of polymers to metals are what are some of the key differentiating characteristics just in broad sense well, they are lighter okay sure organic organics okay although you do have the, some inorganics too but let's say that uh, generally they are high CTE, right? They expand more than metals do, for example. So they have higher coefficient <coughs> expansion. Yeah. Wider range of uh, structures in crystal and the amorphous. So wide range of uh, structures, exactly, uh, which is very important. Extremely high molecular weights, if possible. 
that is a key point. Very high molecular weights in the order of millions sometimes because they are produced by <coughs> chains, right? The molecular chains. And these are not chains like in uh, visible chains, but these are chains at the uh, molecular level side. So you think of them, typically I like to use this analogy of spaghetti or a pit of snakes, if you will. I rather prefer the spaghetti analogy, I guess. Uh, so this is where they are cross-linked in the sense of uh, spaghettis. And um, like you can uh, take a spoon or a fork and uh, essentially take out piece by piece, right, of the spaghetti, if it is uh, noodles, I mean, that, then uh, essentially that's, uh, each of that is a chain. So at the molecular level, if you have hydrocarbon, for example, you have all your backbone of carbons. If you are talking about uh, ethylene, you may have hydrogens uh, in a very structured way, like so, right? If you are talking about polypropylene, you replace this with a CH3, and then that becomes uh, polypropylene all over, right? If you are talking about PVC, you replace this with a, a benzene. Ring, and that becomes, uh, I'm sorry, polystyrene. If you replace that with chlorine, which is a very big atom compared to hydrogen, then that is PVC. So from that you have PP, PE, PVC, uh, polystyrene, and so on. So all these are your commodity polymers, which are uh, typically uh, produced at throwaway prices, right? And when you talk of uh, PET bottles or uh, shampoo bottles, you don't you recycle them, but generally those are at a very uh, low price point because they are produced in uh, thousands of parts. So the volumes are very high, so that's why these would be like your commodity plastics, uh, very high volumes and uh, very low pricing. So there is a lot of push of course to recycle these and later in the class we'll get some into that. Uh, the purpose of recycling simply is because otherwise after use they go into landfill. So you see in your homes and uh, commercial places, there's always a green bin to put them down and put them out. And uh, typically they get uh, sorted. You can't just look at the color and sort these out, right? Because the colors are clear or they may be green. Like looking at this bottle, uh, the same bottle may be polypropylene, you can't say. But these are all PET bottles, right? Polyethylene, terephthalate bottles. Like Eastman makes that polymer right here in Tennessee, for example, large consumption, very, very large uh, market for that. Uh, they are crystalline, you can see, you can hear the crispy sound, that's because these are crystalline, which means the uh, arrangement of the thick benzene um, ring, in this case, is very structured across the backbone, therefore they are very ordered. If you talk about a crystalline polymer, if you look at the chain like this, in a crystalline polymer, the chain has very nicely folded uh, structure like so. So it's very ordered. So it has either short range order, or if the chain is highly ordered, it may have long range orders actually. So materials which are highly crystalline have a long, long range order. Materials which are semi-crystalline, or maybe partially crystalline, they have short range crystallinity. But uh, that guides a lot of the characteristics such as what? Melting point, right? The boiling point of the plastic perhaps. Also heat deflection temperature, which is a critical point in uh, the plastic. The TG, which is uh, thermogravimetric analysis, is used to determine the glass transition of the polymer. So all these characteristics get affected based on uh, several factors, one of them being how amorphous or crystalline it is. If the polymer has no order at all, then it's basically referred to as amorphous, which is no order, right? And when it is crystalline, it means it is highly ordered, so 100%, uh, which is a concept. There is nothing like a 100% crystalline polymer, but it's a concept, right? So you have that uh, range in between. So most of them happen to be uh, semi crystalline So this is, uh, you know all this information, but I just want you to remember this in the context of, uh, of polymers. So this uh, big other factor is there, generally they do not uh, uh, conduct heat or uh, 
electricity, right? I mean, they're generally insulators for the most part. Of course, you can metallize polymers and uh, uh, conductive particles to uh, enable thermal transfer or electrical transfer. But the inherent characteristic is they're not, uh, they're not um, uh, conductors for the most part. Uh, density of most plastics, depending on what category it is, can be under one, like uh, most of the olefins here, etc., like 0 0.9 to 95 and so on, up to 1.6 uh, grams per cc is common for plastic. So that is a very typical range. There are obviously outliers like uh, uh, silanes and so on, which could be slightly heavier as such. Um, now, the other beauty of the plastic chains here is you can change what? You can change its um, uh, feel or what is called as tacticity, right? You can have, for example, a polypropyl PVC is a good example. You may have a soft PVC or you may have a, a rigid PVC, right? And soft PVC is used where? <coughs> Any ideas? Yeah. Plastic soldiers uh, used to be. Uh, yeah. Infant toys, chew toys, um, uh, grips, things like that. Uh, Kitchen floors, for example, you have tiles that you get a dollar, uh, go to Lowe's and buy a one dollar tile set, 12 by 12, those are soft PVC tiles. You're just flexible, you can peel off the backing and lay them down. And they are very common in day-to-day uh, -day commodity use. So soft plastics or soft PVC. Carpeting uses a lot of PVC in that. Why PVC? <coughs> it's got decent wear characteristics. It's not the best, but it's not bad. True, but what is the real reason? It has very high uh, fire resistance in terms of uh, self extinguishing. So if you have a fire inside the kitchen, the PVC will not continue to burn. Once you take the flame out, it will extinguish itself. So that is one of the reasons PVC is chosen in, in, in homes, in kitchens particularly. Rated PVC again, again example in the kitchen, where would you find it? All your kitchen pipes, right? And all the white pipes that you take under the kitchen, <coughs> if you open the uh, drawer, you'll see all those piping is PVC. And that's rigid PVC because same reason it has high fire uh, resistance in terms of self-extinguishing, plus it is uh, rigid, so you can uh, uh, connect pipes, you can screw them on, threads will stay stable, all of the following. And plus bonding of PVC is very good, it has high self-extinguishing characteristics and also it has high uh, bond uh, characteristics. So remember from Lowe's or Home Depot, you buy the bonding uh, paste, the purple color one that you just apply to the pipe, and that actually helps bond one PVC to the next. And then you put a, sometimes also put a sealing, uh, that, uh, flexible uh, tape, right, which actually helps to lock in the bond for pigeons and so on. So all those are polymers in their own rights, but particularly PVC is used in that way. And similarly, you can think of any of those. Uh, how do you make the PVC? And you know that PVC is, this is the structure, right? How do you make one PVC soft and one being uh, rigid? <coughs> Change some of the chain, or some of the bond, uh, outside of the Why? I, I can't remember the compound that you put in. But uh, that's a good point. By changing the tacticity of the polymer, right, which is the position of the chlorine molecule in this, or chlorine atom in this can, can be perfectly controlled in chemistry where it always appears at at this particular point, like CL here, CL here, and so on, that would be called as a very uh, structured, uh, right, a high degree of tacticity. But when you make this CL uh, position uh, kind of uh, a random, or what is called as atactic, which is not tactic, then the chain has a lot of room for conforming together, right? It can assume like a low, uh, uh, low profile, if you will. So the Big chlorine atom otherwise acts as an obstacle. When it acts as an obstacle, it becomes more rigid. So you can change the <coughs> position of that obstacle and make that molecular structure be very rigid. Or you can make it flexible by just changing its, not keeping it orderly. So therefore, the polymer can be much more flexible than the same polymer just by 
changing the position of the respective atom, you can um, uh, change its chemistry. Also, like uh, Steven just said, the uh, molecular weights are high. For example, if I look at polyethylene here, I um, mean here is C2H4, and then I put N. So N can be anywhere from 5 to, say, N could be 10,000 for all I care, right? As long as it's a linear chain polymer, I can keep building that chain as strong as a backbone of the chain as long as I want. And when I do that, you can see that when you multiply 10,000 with each of these, the like hydrogen is 1 and carbon is 2, so you add the molecular weight of the monomer, and when I multiply with 10,000, that becomes the molecular weight of the polymer. So it has very, very high uh, molecular weights. And this particular structure has a very common or very effective use in what application? Like polyethylene, when it is highly uh, stretched and it has a very strong backbone, it is the preferred material for, for ballistic armor, right? All your ballistic plates are made with polyethylene, for one, because the density is less than one, it's very light, and then you can actually get very high degree of alignment from those chains, so the polymer is extremely difficult to tear in that direction. So plates such as uh, Dyneema or Spectra, these are uh, commercial products, uh, but they are all made through, like DSM is the company that makes Dyneema, for example, right? All these products are made with polyethylene, but they are highly aligned polyethylene. That's why it gives you such a high. Is that LDPE? So uh, no, that's more like HDPE polymer. So that's just that's a good point. And then, so I'll, I'll just explain that in one second. You, you said low density, so I wasn't sure. Uh, low density, yeah, but when I talk of LDPE, HDPE, LLDPE, okay. you're talking about point. Uh, 0.96 to 0.98, so the range is very fine, but uh, the term low density I used was in the sense of less than uh, one, so it floats on water, right? So your uh, grocery bags, for example, would be made with uh, LDP, right, low density polyethylene. Your oil cans, etc., that you change oil in, that's made with LLDP. Your uh, exercise machines that you run on is either ultra high molecular weight uh, polyethylene or high density polyethylene. So high density polyethylene still can be of viscosity that can be injection molded and so on. You cannot injection mold uh, ultra high molecular weight. It has to just be compression molded to shape because it just would not zero flow, right? These type of things have what we call as melt flow index MFI is very, very small when it comes to a dry molecule. So the material will refuse to flow, which means you just have to heat it and consolidate it in place. So that's challenging. But all these other categories can be uh, molded to shape. Um, so where I was getting to was the uh, uh, changing the value of N and the position of a certain atom within the monomer and the repeatability of that within a structure, you can make something very rigid or very flexible. Uh, the same concept holds good in uh, polyurethane. You might have heard of TPU, thermoplastic polyurethane, uh, used in shoe soles and rubbers and so on. Those are hard TPU or they can be soft TPU. So that simply comes from changing the specific position of a molecule uh, within the structure. <coughs> You also use a lot of copolymers in the uh, TPEs as well, just to build an extra characteristic. That's a great point. In fact, I will go ahead and explain that in a minute as well. So, just before I lose the chain of thought, uh, these family of polymers are oily by feel, right? If you feel, then they have an oily feel to it. It's not like they're leaching oil, but it's just that shiny, oily, waxy feel. That's why they are referred to as olefins. So when you say olefins, you are talking about polypropylene or polyethylene, that type of material, because it has that uh, uh, waxy feel to it. Actually, wax also could be considered a polymer, right? Except it has very small uh, chain lengths. Therefore, the minute you slide a fire, those chains are easy to disintegrate. 
when you take the same chains now and build it up 100 fold, that material is a lot more uh, uh, resistance to uh, heat or other things. Is that the uh, oily peel, is that ever used in like a lubrication like application? It could be in some cases. It's uh, it's more for in appearance parts or in terms of uh, you don't have a lot of finishing to that as such. But the surface wear depends on. Uh, it certainly has a certain uh, low wear. I mean low uh, sliding characteristics. Right? So it would it could be used for the Usually for lubrication, though, you're adding a, a polyamide or a rismide or something like that to the. Uh, to the plastic as a base to, to blunt the surface to give it. True, so these are base polymers, but like he, like he's saying, you add UV additives, UV stabilizers, you add uh, optical uh, aids. So it never is a polymer used uh, generally on its own. I mean, they are, but when you say homopolymer, you mean it's a pure polymer, right? But it's always blended with something for, for, for those kinds of things. Generally, graphite would be a good lubricant. The lubrication is a critical thing. Graphite lubricates very well because the chains are in a hydrostatic structure. So they're like hexagons and layers of hexagons. So in one direction, the chain is very, very strong. The carbon, right, is a hydrostatic structure. But in the transverse direction, it's very easy to slide those chains. That's why it is used as a lubricant. Um, so, um, Coming to what, uh, so I, let me try to remember what I said here, right? So we uh, talked about the fact that polymers are uh, chain structure. They are like analogy of a spaghetti. We said that the molecular weight could be controlled by the chain lengths and number of monomer units. So as you multiply those, you get uh, very high molecular weights. Well, in metals, you can't do that, right? Like if you take a any metal, it's in the order of hundreds or less. Polymers could be thousands, even millions, in terms of molecular weight. So that's the big difference there. Um, within that, you have uh, uh, some which are uh, processed by what is called an addition polymerization, and some that are processed to condensation polymerization. Right. So, uh, like most of your commodity polymers, when I say commodity, the name comes from the fact these are low price polymers. Like I said, the, all this uh, uh, <coughs> polyethylene, polypropylene, PVC, polystyrene, uh, those are uh, commodities. Again, you, you all know that all your shampoo bottles and milk bottles are within this family of these materials. Uh, high density polyethylene versus LNDP, what makes the difference of high density versus low density? Any idea? So, so it would be your polymer major, right? Well, how does that work? So, so the molecular weight is different. But how do you make it different? So I'm going to argue this is LD, this is HDP, and uh, this is uh, LLDP, right? Linear low density. And this is low density polyethylene. So the reason this becomes high density polyethylene because if you look at the side branches of the main uh, chain and then the side branches of the main chain here, you can see that the length of these side branches and their positions uh, changes the ability of the polymer to chain to collapse on top of each other. Like in this particular case, since the side branches are very small, the next one can come and pack very close, right? And the next one can come and pack very close. So the overall density of that uh, uh, compaction of that polymer is going to be a lot more higher. That way it becomes high density polyethylene. In this particular case, the chains, the side branches are going to kind of entangle and they're not going to allow this thing wants to flex. This thing is going to come in the way, that is going to come in the way. Then the chain naturally has a lot of voids or gaps in there, right? And that makes it, in the, it's not able to densify as much as this one does. So just by controlling the side branch lens, you can change the base polymer. Yes, sir. How do you control the side uh, lens? 
Yeah, that is essentially through chemistry makeup of the uh, providing reactive groups to specific sites. So that's where the chemistry comes into play, basically, right? I mean, you, this is formed through linear chain uh, branching. So you start off with a free radical, a C, C, H, H, H. Keep one uh, radical open, so the next one comes joins it. Next one comes joins it. So by doing so, you can control the free radicals and then make only some positions attached and some don't. So that's how you would uh, change it. So there's a very different uh, application base, like all your grocery bags in the grocery store when you load your bananas, apples, that is also LDPE or LLDPE, right? But those are formed through uh, essentially blow molding, but it's, uh, and I didn't, I didn't get into processes yet, but typically you will extrude the polymer, you will add an air hose at the end of it, you would create a film that kind of rises up like so, and the film separates into two strands, and it comes together, and with electrostatic forces, it is just held together. So what happens is you're creating an extruding polymer from pellets. These pellets go through the extruder. They would uh, become like a charge, right? And that melt that is, comes out is then sent through forced air. When air forces the melt, it becomes a film, right? And that film starts rising up, rising up, and there's like a divider which divides that film into two streams. And then it comes back and collected on the far end and just held together. That's why when you load the bag, you see that you can separate it. It's not bonded. It is just held by electrostatic charge, correct? So you can just separate that out and um, push that out. Of course, at the end, they put a heat sealer at the end to just seal the bag at different points. So at that point, it is fully bonded and they leave the rest of it fully opening. So that's how the films are created for the most part. Um, so they're slightly deviating from that discussion. Uh, but I did want to give you the sense that these are all made through addition polymerization, which means you start off with the monomer and you build your chain by adding to that. That is a perfectly uh, uh, additive uh, chain would just be a straight line, right? Or just a single. But then, uh, always, as you know, they go to the branches because they're reactive groups that help to branch that out. When you talk of condensation polymerization, the second category, that's where most of your engineered polymers are. So when you talk of uh, things like uh, nylons or uh, which is polyamide, or you can talk about uh, polyphenylene sulfide, or you can talk about peak or PET and so on. So basically those are high-end performing polymers. Uh, when would you draw the distinction between commodity and uh, uh, high-end? Obviously these polymers are not as produced in the same quantities as these are. These are for special applications, uh, where like a computer casing or a phone casing or a speaker module. These things you don't produce in millions of parts, right? You make uh, thousands or several hundred thousand, but you cannot um, discard them at the same rate that you can commodity polymers. So then, uh, therefore, these performance, both strength, stiffness, impact toughness, all of these are higher on this scale for these polymers. So it's, I think I may have said this in the first or second class, but there's a well-known triangle for these things where if you look at the bottom of the triangle, these are all your olefin families here. And as you start rising up to this triangle, this is like the Rolls Royce of your uh, polymer performance. So here you're talking about maybe cost versus um, performance here. Or not really, uh, performance or uh, cost both as this. This would be your amorphous and your uh, crystalline. So you can literally group your polymers in this triangle. And you will see that all these, somewhere the cutoff line is here, become your engineered polymers. All these down here are your commodity polymers. So in product development, this is an important uh, concept, because one way to increase performance is to go for higher and higher uh, performing polymers. But what's the downside of doing that? Cost goes up. Also, the polymers become more and more difficult to work, to process, right? Because higher performing polymers means higher molecular weights, higher molecular weights means higher viscosities, 
which means your temperatures have to be higher, energy costs go up, it's all kind of intertwined that way. So you want to be as best as possible in this range because your cost can be down and everything. So one way to do that, therefore, is you start reinforcing the commodity polymers with the fibers, which we'll talk about later, right? And that's one way you can get the same performance that you can from high-end polymers, <coughs> simply by starting to reinforce commodity polymers. Therefore, there's a lot of interest, say, in carbon fiber reinforced polypropylene. You normally not think of it as a, a um, conventional uh, material, right? But the idea there is you're using polypropylene for its cost, and you're using only small amount of carbon to bump up the performance of that system. So therefore, in automotive and um, sporting goods and things, that is becoming a trend now. So you start looking at composites, where traditionally higher in polymers were primarily. So, uh, so in condensation polymer, it's basically also referred to as block, block polymerization. So typically you would have like a part A of something and part B of something, where this may have like a very long monomer. This would be another long uh, monomer, like hexamethylene diamine and adipic acid is used to make nylon, for example. Hexamethylene diamine, right? The name itself is so long, the chain is even longer, right? And adipic acid is the second component to do that. So when these two come together, it forms a block, and that block essentially can be further blocked to the next block. Therefore, you may have poly PA6, so you may have PA66 or PA12. So the family of polyamide nylons, within that family, you can tailor the molecular weight to any degree by a very controlled block polymerization of several things. So therefore, this uh, idea is used, therefore, to produce the engineered uh, polymers, in particular, in, uh, these are all referred to as thermoplastic uh, polymers. And I'll draw that distinction in a minute. <clears throat> so it's really a very uh, uh, versatile uh, options in terms of what you can do with them. Uh, <clears throat> you can also get the... Uh, Enhanced performance or tailored performance strictly by the uh, distribution of the molecular weight in your base polymer. So now I know we used to use uh, uh, metallocene catalyzed uh, polymers to get very uh, tight distributions for some applications and for others you wanted a standard uh, reactive rate because it gave you a very wide distribution. It was tougher. Sure. Um, so you can. By changing the distribution, distribution molecular yeah. weights on the change. Yeah. In fact, distribution also has a big effect on processing <coughs> as well as we will, we will see in a minute. Um, maybe let's talk about that. So if you took look at molecular weight distribution, so typically you talk about a bell curve or a, you know, a skewed curve based on that. So this would be like your uh, number of, uh, like the chain lengths, if you will, on this axis, and this would be your occurrence. So for statistical, you know, understanding. So typically when you talk about a low, uh, narrow molecular weight distribution polymer, you're talking about something like that. It's a very tightly controlled molecular weight distribution. When you talk of something broad, it means the chains could be small, they could be long, they could be something in between, right? They're all over the place, like you say. Now what are the implications of this in processing though? How does this uh, affect processing? Ch changes the flow index. So that when you're, uh, I mean, if you're injection molding this, then it's gonna, it, it could either require you to change your process settings, or it could cause your process to fail. It could cause you to have uh, uh, defects in your in your final part. If you shift and you don't realize you're shifting, because that, that happened to us as well. I mean, first time I, I learned about this was because we had a product line that uh, started cracking at the customer's application, and uh, it turned out it was because the uh, material supplier had changed your. Uh, Catalyst process oh. to metallocene uh, catalyst without saying anything. You know, it was not only the same plastic, but uh, because the distribution changed, we were close enough to the functional edge of the performance that all of a sudden things that used to not crack began cracking. Started, yeah, yeah exactly. it was a big deal. And, and it was so subtle, it was. Uh, Molecular weights changed, I suppose, in that case. So, in that chain of thought, which of these two would be suited for injection molding? But you can do either, but the uh, the, the narrow weight um, gives you a uh, tighter uh, 
process characteristics. Exactly, this is a good point, right? Like what happens in this is preferred for injection molding. Why? Because in injection molding, you start off with solid pellets, and you want preferably all those pellets to break down at about the same time, right? Otherwise, you have like they say islands in sea phenomenon, right? Some part of it has already molded, some parts is still solid. Now you have no control on the process because it's a very broad distribution. When you have a narrow distribution, you know, like when you hit that 550F temperature, I would say 90% of your chains have melted or they have started uh, easy to flow. Therefore, you can have a very controlled flow and a very controlled part. So that's a very big uh, deal in injection molding. When you're doing extrusion sort of processes, you want the molecular weight to be broad because it gives you enough uh, mass melt, or I mean the melt stability, to draw the part so it doesn't completely collapse on its own. So you have extrusion grade polymers and you have injection grade polymers and that comes from the fact of how is their distribution of the molecular weight. So that is a very, very key point. So this has a lot of implications on processing uh, methods. So every time you see the uh, data sheets, you should also realize injection molding uh, great polymers also not only have narrow molecular weight, they would also have shorter chain lengths for the same reason that the polymer can be uh, molten down in a, in a consistent way and it can flow through the process in a very repeatable fashion. So, so this is uh, very important when you're doing process selection. You just can't say, I want to do HDP. You have to go in and define the melt uh, specifics and molecular weight. So that brings us to a term we have already talked about today called what? Uh, melt flow index, right? MFI. So if you go to industry, most of the time they will talk in this language. So uh, you should at least be familiar with what they are talking about. MFI stands uh, for melt flow index. So the way you, it's a very simple test. The way you do that is you would um, uh, essentially dispense polymer from whatever uh, out here, and then start collecting the polymer in a container, right? And you look at how many grams per 10 minutes or how many grams per 60 minutes are collected. And that way, you have a measure of at least saying what is the uh, flowing characteristics of the polymer. So if I have a high melt flow index polymer, what does that signify? It flows very easily. It flows easily, which means it has very low. Viscosity, right? It could also mean it has much lower molecular weights, right? When I have a high, uh, low melt flow index, which means very difficult, like MFI equal to zero for ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, which tells me that this one does not want to flow at all. So then this one would be, means it's lower viscosity, I'm sorry, higher viscosity and higher molecular weight. So this is a term that is. A common man's term in the industry for quickly getting a feel for what is the flow of the polymer. Of course, when you go into the labs, you're going to go into a lot more detailed studies such as what? You would do rheology like they say, right? So you would use like a viscometer and viscosity is measured in number of ways. Usually you do measure viscosity as a function of uh, shear rate. That means you have to shear the polymer at a certain uh, speed. So you have spindles to uh, shear this polymer, right? So therefore you have uh, things called uh, parallel plate viscometer or rheometer. You have cone and plate rheometers and so on. Uh, for composites, when we get into that, when you have a lot of fiber loaded in the polymer, you have uh, squeeze flow re uh, uh, rheometer. So there's a number of uh, variations of this uh, testing. And then you can plot for different rates. Typically, what how will this curve look like? Because as shear rate goes up, viscosity has to come down, right? Which means you're able to thin the polymer faster and faster with that condition. So therefore, uh, higher the shear rate, lower is the viscosity. So as you know, then that gives you the further information of what material is Newtonian flow and which ones are called as non-Newtonian flow, right? So how does that work? What is a Newtonian flow? Shear is proportional, proportional to um, shear is not flow. 
So viscosity proportional shear rate, let's say, is a proportional curve like that. What about a non-Newtonian flow? You could have something like this, right? Or you could have something like that. Or you could have something like that, right? So when something like this takes place, as you start increasing the shear rate, there's a non-linear uh, change. This would be towards the tendency to reduce. What does that signify? It means this is shear thinning, right? Like the pen you're writing with, or the paint that you apply to the wall, all that is shear thinning. The minute you apply a shear force, the material starts flowing. The minute you stop, it stops flowing, right? So those are shear thinning as a function of applied shear rate. In some cases, as you apply more shear, you start the material starts actually thickening. So these are referred to as uh, shear thickening behavior, correct? And when the when does shear thickening occur, or where is it commonly used? Silly hmm? putty. Silly putty, exactly. Cornstarch and water. <laughs> Cornstarch and water. <coughs> A very important application in the military for this type of behavior is, in, again, in terms of ballistic armor. How does that work? Like, if a bullet comes at the armor at a uh, high rate of speed, right? The material inside is, starts exhibiting shear thickening behavior, which means as a function of shear, it becomes more and more rigid. So if you have, like, ethylene glycol and you mix it with... Uh, a certain uh, suspended particles in that, those particles start aligning. And that's why it's soft armor, where you can actually shape it to the body, and it contours in a regular use, and a normal shear, but you get high shear, that thing starts becoming like a rigid mass, and therefore that blocks the uh, uh, deflection, or it actually raises deflection. So it has a lot of interesting behavior in that. And then there is this independent behavior called thixotropic, which are what? Thixotropic is shear rate independent. So the most annoying uh, application is the ketchup, right? The black, I mean the uh, ketchup bottles, you're beating it from the back, this thing does not want to, to right? It's very calm. You take a spoon or a fork and work your way. So until you have a certain uh, gravity, only then it flows. Actually. So those are examples of thixotropic, which are shear rate independent. And the reason we are discussing all this is all these have high implications in the manufacturing of the product because if you do not understand the rheology of what it's going to exhibit, you can't define the process. If you can't define the process, you can't define your product. Therefore, the fluid mechanics part of it is very integrated in the polymer world for, for sure. And this like molecular weight distribution, the uh, chain lengths, the cross-linking, which we'll talk in a minute, and the melt flow index, all these affect your uh, manufacturing techniques. So, as you read up a chapter on the manufacturing, I would say that there's a lot of underlying polymer uh, chemistry or uh, polymer uh, behavior that you need to appreciate and see why some, some things do the way they do. Then you have this whole business of uh, classification of uh, of the polymers. In a broad sense, uh, polymers would be classified as three categories, right? One is so-called as uh, thermosetting polymers, uh, thermoplastic polymers, right? And then what else? TPEs. Elastomers, exactly. So in a very uh, uh, basic sense, what are the attributes of these? Uh, what would be thermosets in general? What is the characteristic of thermosets? Uh, once you uh, match process and cure it, it's, you can't redo it. So one way, right? So once you process, you can't reverse it. So again, they're all chain-like chain, chain -like materials. There's no difference. But in thermosets, you have, again, this spaghetti that's uh, uh, like this. The only difference is wherever you have crossover points, they are now locked by these dots, which are referred to as <coughs> uh, three-dimensional cross links. So the polymer is, uh, and these are not uh, like somebody is taking a thumb tag and holding them together. These are cross-linked in a chemical sense. So you are bonding between them as a chemical bond. So these are highly chemically bonded, right? And therefore, uh, uh, they are non-reversible. So thermal uh, sets 
therefore generally have high modulus, right, because they are stiff. Also they have high uh, strength for the same reason. They are very uh, uh, effective in high strength and high modulus applications. Where they would have a downfall therefore is in? Brittle, which means lower impact toughness. They tend to be brittle. And you can see the glassy polymers crack. I mean, you've seen this uh, in day-to-day -day life, right? And therefore, uh, some of the other attributes, they have very high thermal stability, um, easy processivity. Uh, they generally have low viscosities. Because uh, they are usually produced from multi-component systems, which means you need an accelerator or a catalyst to kick off a reaction. So if you go to Walmart and buy a two-part epoxy to repair a shoe or a glass, it comes in two parts, right? The reason it's called two-part is one part is the resin, the second part is the catalyst. And there's a certain ratio it has to be put together. You just cannot uh, uh, go at one-to-one -one for everything, right? You have to see what is the proper ratio, usually hard enough, maybe 30 percent of the resin, as example. Yes. Well, you also have the heat set, um, the thermal set, so all, all the beauty product, the, the high-end uh, closures. Correct. Heat is a, always a big catalyst in this, because why is heat uh, preferred in uh, accelerating a thermal set reaction? Heat starts the mobility, right? Once it starts mobility, it means it will increase the uh, number of cross links, because that many more encounters will take place. And therefore, the polymer can cure very, very quickly. So you can have the same polymer cure in 30 minutes, or you can accelerate it down to five minutes. I was, they're, they're, I was trying to point out, they're, they're not always multi-component. Uh, oh, it closure. could be a single component. Yeah, it's usually, usually yeah, covered sure. as a powder. And it's, uh, Sorry, it's okay. I have to that point. Yeah, that is correct. They, so they don't always have to be in two components. Like uh, Stephen said, you can just use heat as a as an activator and then cure the system. In fact, it happens, you get 55 gallon drums, they sit in the in your plant, and within a year, if you don't use it, the resin starts gelling only on its own, without an accelerator, right? Which means there's enough chemistry in there to finish the cure. So you can, you have to literally throw those out because you can't do it. Therefore, all of them have very limit, I mean, very defined shelf life. They have to be used within that period. If not, they will start self cross which is, it takes a while, but it can happen. That is So these are uh, common systems. Uh, commercially, of course, uh, things like epoxies and uh, a very common thermoset, uh, phenolics are thermosets, uh, polyesters are thermosets. And these are polyethylene, this is polyester. Uh, vinyl esters are thermosets, right? So there's a whole range of uh, bismelamides, BMIs and so on. So there is, uh, again, based on uh, cost, most of the boat builders and low-end applications use polyesters because they are cheap. Uh, most of the aircraft companies would prefer epoxies because they are high-strength, high-performing parts. Also, when you select these materials, you have to look for the, what they call is the FST performance, which is the fire, smoke, and toxicity. Now, you don't want to use too much epoxy inside an aircraft cable, right? Because Epoxy has very high smoke density. When you burn epoxy, it will, uh, just the amount of smoke inhalation can kill the people, right? So you don't want to, therefore, there's a lot more use of uh, phenolics in aircraft in seniors. Like when you put your baggage and all that, you can see all the interior compartments are typically glass fiber with phenolic resin. Because phenolic has very high char yield. It does not smoke as much. It will char. Char is a good thing in fire because a char has enough um, strength retention. So like wood is a good one for charring because wood keeps its strength even after it starts burning. So this, therefore it's used in uh, ship decks and so on because fire can be the biggest reason there. Uh, but in joints and a lot of interior electronic uh, componentry, all of that epoxy is still uh, very much used in aircraft. Exteriors, heavy epoxy, like all your uh, aircraft wings and fuselage and the main primary structure is uh, if it's a composite aircraft it is carbon fiber with epoxy because of its high strength uh, requirement.
when you talk of thermoplastics, like I was telling you here, you have the commodity thermoplastics, you have the uh, engineered thermoplastics. How do they differ from the thermosets? Is from the same spaghetti, right? But there is very little cross-linking. They are lightly cross-linked or not cross-linked. Therefore, they have with heat. What can happen? The chains can start moving around. When you stop the heat, the chains can consolidate. So it's basically consolidation on uh, by forming like that. So. Therefore, these are very important in automotive, etc. now because of their ability to be recycled. So after you're done with the use of the car, you can reverse the reaction simply by uh, taking advantage of the reversible chemistry. So thermoplastics are becoming very important in green applications. Wherever you want green, that's what it is used. Uh, thermoplastic examples, like I've already given a whole bunch in the olefin family, as well as in the engineer family, like PS6 and so on. So I would encourage you to review that as well. Now when you come to elastomers, they are also essentially long chain materials. But the key difference in elastomers is again, they are very lightly cross-linked, but they have very high degree of elongation. Like uh, typically, if you talk about neoprene rubber or you know, any of the uh, deep thermoplastic polyesters and things like that, those are uh, typically used because of their high elongation. So your tires and your uh, uh, beds and so on, they all there's a lot of use of those in, in terms of their ability to elongate. So I just wanted to first uh, give you the. Uh, recap the basics of uh, polymers in case uh, uh, there are non-polymer people. I know that some of you know this very well, but like I said, I will balance the content based on who is taking uh, from different uh, curriculum and so on. So, so with this in mind, uh, what we can do is I will not get into each process today, but we'll instead go to a product and work our way to process it there. So that way we can uh, work it out. Any questions here or comments? This was a very quick rundown. Of course, this could be a semester long course in itself, right? So since this is the football season, right? I thought let's do a football helmet today. And while so I'm sticking to parts which are essentially plastic or polymers for this discussion, for not matter, right? So that is that is important. So before I put up some slides, let me ask you all some questions. Right? So who, uh, who uh, not, not ask which team you support or anything like that, but uh, I guess what what do you know about football helmets in general? So, I think pretty hard. <laughs> High energy absorption. So there, first of all, there is youth helmets, and then there is adult helmets, right? Of course, uh, youth helmets is by far the largest market out there, right? Because there are so many thousands of kids who play uh, football. If you go down to adult helmets, and then just look at between the college NCAA versus NFL, uh, NFL market is really very small, but it, although it gets the highest attention, it's actually less than 1,000 players total, right, who participate in the NFL. If you had all the teams and uh, look at uh, <coughs> their backups and so on, no matter all that, still the market is very, very comparatively small. College football, the market could be thought of as less than 100,000, still it is small. I mean, you can still, uh, maybe this could be debated could be slightly higher than that. But here you are talking about greater than at least 500,000 in terms of the market size as such. So there is uh, a lot of attention of course to this given, and then obviously very high attention to this. This is known as important, but then the safety that you see in uh, this helmet versus this helmet are not always uh, seen in the youth helmet. Why is that the case? Smaller. Cost, right? Cost. Unless the parent goes out and buys the helmet specifically for the child, the school is not going to invest in uh, 
100 helmets for a certain price, but they will certainly invest in a team. It's a college team because the revenues are very different in, in this market. So that is so. First thing to point out here is the economics are very different when you're designing with this type of product. Right? It's a different economics, and you should understand that market. Where is it that your uh, market is in this case? Um, So if you look at today's uh, helmet manufacturers, uh, <coughs> what does, because uh, let's say you are getting into the competition for making helmets, first of all you will do market research, right, that's the first thing in any product you will do market research, so you say who else is doing it except you. Remember you are not always the first, always you think you are, but there is always somebody doing something already, and this market is significant market share already. So if you look at this pie chart, who holds most of the markets in the football element? I'll just draw a few. Rydale. Rydale is a big uh, company. Every football element, you'll see the Rydale speaker sitting in front of their heads, and this is the other one. Shirt. So Shirt and Rydale are the two major players in this market, right? But they are not all, there are others. And this, you can argue the size of this pie, but there are few others. For example, Rawlings is one, they have helmets on there. There is Zenith helmets on the market. And then there are others, let me say, right? But most of the NFL or college helmets would be in that range. And then the youth helmets, you can start getting like Rawlings, of course, does a lot of baseball elements. That's their market share, the highest. But they have entered the football market to some extent. But this is a very uh, closed uh, community. It's not so uh, widespread uh, uh, because for several reasons that we'll discuss. But here we are thinking that uh, you are entering the market out here, right? So you must first uh, uh, idea of this is you should be able to do your market research. So that is what we are trying to do in the research. So when you do this, uh, now you have to remember the product you are designing cannot be dramatically different, like out of the blue, but it has to be, first of all it should be what? Uh, distinctive, which means you should have a reason that your product stands out, right? And it should hopefully have higher performance or at least comparable performance say for equal or less price, correct? Or you should target a market that is not being targeted by any of these companies say, but you, only in this case you have some chance of selling the product, right? Also in terms of performance, it should have the same levels of safety, particularly in football elements that's a uh, concern is safety. You cannot just um, not do those two particular things. So again, now between these two guys, I mean, you, s you will see in the news that they keep suing each other every two months for a reason, right? It's a very competitive market. So Rydell shoes shut, shut shoes and back, and just for this is how they lawyers make a lot of money in the process, right? But basically this is, so you can very well imagine that Shirt is going to show you or Rydell is going to sue you the minute you enter into this market. That means you should have a Shirt case when it comes to how different your product is. So in terms of a football helmet today, let's uh, just uh, try to draw one here, right? So if you look at, let's say, this is the helmet here, and then uh, typically you have a shell, Right, and then this has, uh, of course, a some kind of a face guard here, like so. It has a ear piece, for example, that's there, and then there are other things that go on. So inside this, you're going to have the padding. And as we discuss this today, you will see how how critical this whole uh, these matches are. So a typical football helmet, uh, everybody agrees that there is a face mask and then there is a uh, straps, of course I'm not showing the straps here, and then down here somewhere there is the chin guard, right? The one that the chin guard, then the straps that attach to the chin guard, 
there's a padding in the shell. So if you look at both these, all these uh, companies I shared, they have the same product, but then they have very different products within that, they, because they are distinguishing their product uh, very differently. So we should see how they do that, for example. Uh, <coughs> any idea, for example, what the shell is made out of? You can always go back to Granta and understand why it's made of that, but what is the typical material used in shells, anyone knows? These are very thin shells, about 3 millimeters in thickness, right? they're very thin, they're not very thick shells. Almost all football helmets today in the market are made out of uh, polycarbonate alloys. And the polymers I described here, I didn't call out polycarbonate, but it's one of the ones that's made through condensation polymerization. The big characteristics of polycarbonate are what? It has high impact toughness, low scratch resistance, low scratch. It has very high degree of optical clarity. Not transparent, I mean, in terms of providing optical clarity. It's very bondable, right? So it has good bonding characteristics as well. Uh, these are some of the things, which means it is very much paintable, correct? So it has the ability to be painted as well. So when you're selecting this, uh, you have to rank this, of course, in terms of strength, stiffness, etc. But these I would call out as general attributes for why polycarbonate is used. And why is it an alloy? Like we didn't talk about the copolymerization or the, uh, we talked about homopolymers, but you can always change the base polymer with enhanced uh, additions to it. Like that's what these typically are made out of polycarbonate. The biggest other thing I forgot to mention here is it is injection moldable. So your processing costs, therefore, are very cheap, right? I mean, a Rydell or a shirt today sells for anywhere from three twenty to four sixty nine dollars, right? I mean, it's a big range there. This is a big sell for ball helmet. They weigh typically what? The base uh, base helmet with all without anything weighs about three and a half pounds. When you add your straps and the pads and everything, it can go up to four point six, four point seven pounds. So it's not a small weight because it's a light player, like the uh, runners on the side and so on. That is a very different helmet from somebody like a defensive player who is going to get hit right in the middle. So the running uh, backs, etc., would have a very different helmet than the players. Not everybody uses wears the same helmet. I don't know if everybody knew that actually, but uh, but they are all made from this family of, of, of parts right there, right? So that is the thing. Now within Rydale or Shet, for example, I'm just um, saying, like Rydale, you can see their helmets, they have a 360 degree revolution helmet, right? Or they have a Rydale, uh, uh, what is called, an FS7 helmet, I believe. So they have a lot of these models that are more like marketing, uh, or talking about safety of these helmets. If you look at Shet, for example, you may have a Shet Vengeance helmet, which is uh, common in their line of products, for example. So each year, just like you put out car models, they put out helmet models in that particular case. You might also have noticed in the NFL or anything that some of these helmets have like a hexagonal patch now in the front, right? They have this right in the, out in this position right there. And therefore, this is called as a Rydell Flex. This helmet is called as a Rydell Flex here. Again, so I did a lot of looking into that. There is very little that that thing actually does to the performance of the helmet, but where does it help them? In the differentiation of their product and branding, correct? So this is where they are using this concept for branding and for differentiation. So therefore, Shet cannot copy this anymore because Rydell has already put that into, into the market. So very high branding with some amount of performance enhancement, which could be debated for our view in, in that particular case. Um, so, in terms of construction of the helmet, you can see that the shell is thin, 
which has this kind of characteristics. But you may notice that actually polycarbonate uh, alloy shells will not do what? They will not absorb much energy, correct? Because it's such a thin shell that the force is immediately transmitted to the inside of the head. So the shell by itself, the reason it has to be thin is it has to be light. But in terms of actually what it does performance wise, it does not really help you lot of, uh, do a lot of energy absorption here. So which means where is the energy being absorbed then? In the padding. So today's helmets, most of the energy is being absorbed in the padding. <coughs> And uh, what is the attributes of the padding for a Rydell helmet, say? Again, you might have observed this. So basically, when I watch uh, football on Sundays, I'm, not, I'm interested in the game, but I'm more interested in what they're wearing, right? For a reason, because I want to know who is wearing what. And uh, just to get a feel for why they are, they are doing that particular thing. So Rydell, if you see, have pretty much all these kind of white foam pads on the inside. And this foam characteristic is very unique. It basically has what a, it's a gradiated foam. Which means it is stiff at the point of contact, right, where it is connected and then it becomes softer and softer as you go towards the skull region. So this is you in the skull. This is the outer shell right here. So when the contact is made, this is hard, so that it's hard to basically resist deformation. And it slowly kind of rides down the uh, impact towards the skull. The skull, it has to be soft because it has to have comfort on the inside, right? It means there is a certain gradient. The army uses this a lot in their blast helmets and so on because they have to have a gradiated structure. So it's like a bean bag effect, if you will. If you sit on a bean bag, what happens? You're sitting hard and then slowly you're working your way in. So that's how the Rydell helmets work in terms of this kind of design. So this uh, particular um, foam pads can be changed or positioned any way. It's not necessarily locked into a certain position. So usually they will have like a, a Velcro. And most of them have a Velcro. And the Velcro you can take out a pad and put it exactly to your head. Like if you look at the Seahawks player, the big guy with the braids, right? The Sherman, correct? So Sherman has huge braids. You look at the Patriots player, the the Rob uh, not Jerkowski, Gronowski, I think, right? Bald, balding, fully bald, or at least clean shaven. So many players prefer clean shaven. Some want to go as crazy in the braids as you can. Which means you change the helmet for every single player. You can only change the ability to uh, position these pads at different places, for one. And in that you can put an inflatable, uh, inflatable wall, so that if uh, the guy in Patriots wants to wear the same helmet, he has to inflate his, his inside pads to a higher degree, so that the contact of the pads to the head is just the right fit. If somebody with braids wants to use that, like Richard Sherman wants to use it, he doesn't need that much of inflating of the <coughs> He can inflate it less, so that it fits better to his head. So the going back, to think of this more than the players, the product design part of it. This is a very clever padding design to accommodate for uh, the changes of size, because large, medium, small does not fit. Like if I wear a shoe size, I always wear like a 12 and a half or 13 and a half, difficult to get, right? But if you either you get a 12 or you get a 13. So that's how to adjust it. This in football world, it's a, you can't change anything on the shell, so you're changing it on the pad. So that is the thing. So now that uh, Rydell has already done this, what is Shet going to do? They cannot copy the foam uh, gradient design because so they'll get sued right away, right? So they have a very different uh, approach for the padding. I don't know if you all have seen this padding. It's basically like a, it has, and again, Aaron Rodgers wears this all the time. You can see that his element has this blue thing showing from there. And what is the blue pad? If you look at the pad, it has this kind of uh, conical cross section here. 
and then there is the inverted cones like that. So if you look at uh, the design of these pads, these pads are made out of uh, one is like a hard TPU, the other one is a soft TPU. So it's a combination of hard and soft TPU. So why is the hard TPU required? So that the helmet, the pads don't just collapse on itself, correct? It will resist that. Why is the soft TPU required for absorbing the energy? By inverting one cone into the next cone, you get a very geometrically efficient design, very efficient design geometrically, right? So it has very high degree of geometric efficiency for energy absorption. So the military uses this in uh, what they call as the Skydex uh, product. I think we have an example even in the lab. So the blast panels on the bottom of the flooring is like one cone uh, bonded to the other cone, so that when these cones collapse, they will spring right back and they absorb a huge amount of energy in the collapse of the cones and spring back. So that, uh, what Shunt did is they took that concept and they applied it to the helmet uh, padding. And this way they got a very differential design to do the same function that Rydale does, right? But they both are absorbing energy. Both claim they are better than the other, and that's for the user to determine. But some players develop a comfort level with one helmet, and they never want to change that. The other player will develop it with the other. But both are adjustable pads. They can take it out and position it anywhere they want, and therefore they can uh, take care of the issue of uh, head sizes and so on, or head size or head uh, um, preferences, I guess. I'm going to call it in terms of braiding versus not. And in this particular business, as you know, like you will do the same. If you know even that a bigger helmet is safer, every player has to pass what is called as a mirror test. If they look in the mirror and they don't like it, they are not going to wear even if it's the most safest helmet in the world. Which means your design has to be suited for their aesthetic uh, requirement and appeal. Not only that it does functionally well, it has to meet those uh, mirror test characteristics as well. So that is a very uh, uh, uncalled, I mean it's not a called out requirement, but that is the reality. No player will wear it if he or she does not like what they see in the mirror. So, uh, so, what I want to do is give you now, based on this discussion, uh, I want to go beyond the, the selection of the material and start looking at holistically from the product sense. Right? So, in this product, how does the, what applies? You can use everything we have used to first define your translation requirements, right? Based on everything you've discussed. You can also go in and start picking up what material choices may be good for the helmet, right, based on that. Uh, you can determine what are your critical calculations for this. For example, we have not yet talked about a head impact, head-to-head -head normal impact, or a side impact. Because side impact causes rotational strain on the neck. So it's a lot more uh, dangerous to get a side impact than a front impact, right? So in this world, they use the analogy of a chimpanzee or a woodpecker. So you can beat a chimpanzee all day long on its head from the front, is fine. But the minute you hit him from the side, such a big neck, right? But still, that's enough to give him concession, right? concussion, right? And a woodpecker, same way. How does a woodpecker work? Its bone structure is designed that it can keep on chipping away the wood from the front and still not get a concussion. I don't know how a concussion in a bird looks like, but let's assume that uh, it won't get that, uh, that, uh, that you know, damage. Mm -hmm. So it can do that function all day long. So the same thing in the football player. Uh, this pad and the rider says this particular uh, tab helps in the normal impact as such. But if you hit this player from the side, which happens a lot, you can see that that results in uh, that's why there is that uh, targeting penalty they do and so on, because that can cause a next strain to the player. And that's why that's, safety is such a big political debate in football, uh, just like the NRA is in the gun world, right? So, but yeah, I'll stop here and then I'll continue this uh, next class. Um, so like I said, next class I'm uh, not here, but I will uh, 
challenge you through a video and then you know we can uh, so we'll meet back in class Tuesday please and uh, about Thursday I will let you all know what the deal is that would be the idea. You're going to be here? Or is it going to be just... Virtually, I'll be here virtually. So I will ask a question to each person there to make sure you're here. You can't repeat the same as the way. You can, but I'll lock the door too. Somebody will lock the door, so you can't just wave yeah. and get out. <laughs> I guess I just don't know what to say.